Welcome to the Liberty Baptist Sermon Archives. The message you're about to hear was preached at Liberty Baptist Church in Easton, Massachusetts. You can find out more about us or contact us at mylibertybaptist.org or just look us up on Facebook. And now we hope that this message from God's Word will be a blessing to you. It's good to be able to be back in 1 Samuel in our lessons and leadership and to be able to see Samuel assuming the leadership position now of the people of God. And the people of God are certainly at a crossroads here in the sense that the Ark of the Covenant was taken. There was a period of time where the Ark of the Covenant was away from the people of God and with the Philistines. And you'll remember that God had done some very miraculous things, not just to the Philistines, but also to the statues, to that false god Dagon, to show those people that he was God. But yet the Philistines, how devastating it was that God was gracious and merciful to them, but yet they didn't get the memo. They didn't get the message of what God was trying to tell them, that He is the only wise and powerful God. There are no other gods. The only conclusion they come to was this, or came to rather, was this. we got to get this ark out of here. And you'll remember they loaded up the ark uh, in a cart that was pushed or pulled rather by uh, a uh, cows that were separated uh, from their young cattle. Uh, it was loaded with golden mice and golden emeralds. You say golden emeralds, yeah, you had to be here. All right, we're not going over that again. Uh, but all this is loaded up and then the Ark of the Covenant is brought back to the people of Israel. There's great rejoicing, but there's a problem. They decide to look inside of the Ark of the Covenant and we saw that God, God smote them in a very incredible way. So we see that there is this time of mourning, then there's a time of rejoicing, and then there's another time of mourning because of what had happened when the ark was open. And so spiritually, they're going up and down and up and down and up and down. Can anyone relate to that? Can anyone look at their own life and their own way of living and maybe have a little bit of relation to what we're talking about here as we approach 1 Samuel chapter number 7. Just talking with someone recently and uh, even bringing this up again in our men's discipleship here this morning. And I just wish the Christian life was one that we went straight up, that the trajectory was always going up. But I think we would all have to say that when it comes to the Christian life, there's peaks and valleys, aren't there? There's ups and there's downs. Now, like the stock market, or at least like the stock market should, the upward trajectory does go up. However, it's not just a trend line going straight up. It's up and down, and then a little bit higher and down, and a little bit higher and down. And part of that process of making sure that we are who we need to be and that we don't just go down spiritually, but that we go back up is something that we call in the Word of God, revival. Revival. Now, when some people hear the word revival, they cringe or there's confusion. And there's a couple of reasons for that. There's confusion because there are groups that will take the word revival and what they mean is that there is some sort of strange outpouring of the Spirit. And by the way, not a Holy Spirit, but a strange outpouring of the Spirit, or a Spirit rather, that causes people to laugh uncontrollably, to roll on the ground, to bark like a dog, and blame it all on God and call it revival. There's uh, a movement about 20 years ago, or maybe a little bit more now, called the Pensacola Revival that was something very similar to that where people were literally out of control in the name of Jesus, and Jesus didn't have anything to do with it. And so when there are some people that hear that word revival, that's what they think of, a religious ecstasy that is out of control, unhinged, and has nothing to do with God. And so because of that, there are some people that have some difficulty with that word revival. But then there's also, in the other direction, us as independent Baptists. And I mentioned a couple weeks ago when we changed a little bit of the order of service and we all had heart palpitations because like, oh, we got to do this the same way all the time because we're Baptists. You know, even tonight, it's like, oh, we can't have a special on Sunday night. That's not the way we do things. But Dover can't talk. We don't have, you know, it's a, we say we can do different things, but we don't do different things. You know how I know that? You all sit in the same chairs all the time. I would love one Sunday for everybody to sit in a different chair and I would just get up here and think, I got to leave. There's something wrong with me. I don't, I, don't, I don't even recognize these people. I don't know where they are. I don't know what they're doing. We are creatures of habit, aren't we? We certainly are. That is the case. I, I was just uh, in Springfield, Missouri last week and preaching and there were people that I had not seen for about two years and they were sitting in the same places when I saw them two years ago. 
I don't even know if they got up in two years and left. Maybe they just stayed there. I don't know. But we as independent Baptists do things in a very similar way all the time. And one of them is having revival meetings. If you've been at independent Baptist churches for any length of time, we have something they called a revival meeting. Typically, we have one here at Liberty every year. We don't this year because we had someone that was scheduled that because of some unforeseen circumstances had to cancel and didn't feel led to be able to put someone back on the calendar. But oftentimes, when we as independent Baptists think about revival, we think about dates on the calendar. We think about a Sunday to Wednesday meeting where someone from out of town will fly in and preach to us and it's really just like church, but with a different preacher for three or four days, and we call that revival. Now, the first one that I mentioned, that religious ecstasy, if you will, is not biblical revival. In fact, it's quite unbiblical. Now, having a revival meeting is not unbiblical. There's nothing wrong with it. In fact, I think it's a good thing for us to take stock of our spiritual life, have a little bit of a spring cleaning, if we could call it that spiritually, remind ourselves maybe some places where we've grown loose or lax over the past year. But even that is not true revival. There's a difference between a revival meeting and revival. As I've said before, not unique to me, but revival doesn't come on a 737. Revival doesn't come because we fly someone in and give them a love offering. Revival comes when God's people submit themselves to be able to draw closer to Jesus Christ. In fact, I would put it this way. Revival isn't a spiritual frenzy. It's a serious focus on the things of God in a real and personal way. Let me say that again. Revival is not a spiritual frenzy. We're not emotionally whipping people up. It's a serious focus on the things of God in a real and a personal way. I need to draw closer to God. And that's what we're going to see here in 1 Samuel chapter 7 as the seeds of revival start to sprout in the people of Israel and we find that they draw closer to God. And as they do so, God provides. And as they do so, God protects. And God does what only He can do in the lives of the people of Israel. Would you stand please for the reading of God's Word? We're in 1 Samuel chapter number 7. As I've already mentioned, we'll read the entire chapter here tonight. Boy, it's good to see you here in God's house tonight. Thank you so much for being here. First Samuel chapter number 7, verse number 1, it says this, And the men of Kirjath-Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kirjath-Jerim that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So there's a 20-year period of stagnation. A 20-year period where the ark of the God, uh, the ark of the Lord rather, is honored, but yet the people are not where they need to be. And so it continues with Samuel standing up, Samuel taking leadership, and spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord, consider those words, return unto the Lord. If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. Now, why do they need to be delivered from the hands of the Philistines? They've been under the thumb of the Philistines for at least 20 years because of what had happened when the Ark of the Covenant was taken away at the end of Eli's judgeship. So they are still under bondage. They are still under the rule of these ungodly Philistines. Verse 4 is encouraging. Israel doesn't always make good choices, do they? That's the understatement of the day. Verse 4, Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and serve the Lord only. Amen. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mitzpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mitzpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mitzpah. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mitzpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb, offered it for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them 
and they were smitten before the Lord. And the men of Israel went out of Mitzpah and pursued the Philistines, and they smote them until they came unto Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mitzpah and Shen, and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hither hath the Lord helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they came no more into the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Israel or reign of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. And the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron even unto Gath. And the coast thereof did Israel deliver out of the hands of the Philistines, and there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mitzpah, and judged Israel in all those places. And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house. And he, there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. It's one of those days where we read the word of God in relation to the people of Israel, and it's good where we read about Israel coming to a crossroads and they choose the right thing and they choose the right direction. When Samuel says, return unto the Lord, and revival came to the people of Israel. There's some elements of revival that are here that are helpful for us tonight as we consider what true revival looks like. Heavenly Father, be with us this evening as we get in the Word. Help me to be able to present rightly and thusly what your Word says. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Psalm 85, verse 6 says this, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? When a spirit is revived, when a spirit is not just alive in Christ, but revived in Christ, because he's following the Lord as he's been commanded to do, there is rejoicing that comes in the life of a believer. And so we see here in chapter number 7 that Samuel, assuming the judgeship for 20 years, where's Samuel? For 20 years, what is he doing? And the answer is, I don't know. It could be that for 20 years, God was preparing Samuel, maybe in a very similar way to the 40 years that God was preparing Moses for the right time to be the leader of the people of Israel. I don't know. I have conjecture, but I really don't want to waste time on tonight where Samuel was during this time. All I know that there was a spiritual crisis in the life of the people of Israel, and at this very critical juncture, here is Samuel with the message, and he's saying this, repent, get right with God. And for true revival to take place, a very similar message must not just be preached by God's man, but must be heeded by God's people. And so as we consider true revival tonight, not a revival meeting, not any of these unbiblical definitions of what revival is, but truly consider having a heart that is revived and enlivened and encouraged to the things of God, there's some elements here in this text that are helpful for us tonight. And the first thing that I see from this text is this, when it comes to the people of Israel, number one, they place themselves under leadership. They place themselves under leadership. You say, why is that remarkable? Well, because in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did that which was right in their own eyes, as we saw twice at the end of the book of Judges. Remember, that may have been freedom, but it wasn't liberty. They may have been free, but they were making decisions that were contrary to God, and we see that it caused great disaster to the people of Israel. Hence what happened at the beginning of 1 Samuel. Remember, there was, uh, there was, uh, the word of God was precious in those days. Not that it was close, oh, it is so precious, but the fact that God wasn't speaking to the people of Israel. There was no open vision. And so with all of this taking place, here comes Samuel, assuming the leadership. By the way, he wasn't usurping leadership. He was assuming the leadership that was given to him by God. And he comes and he preaches and his message again was to repent. In fact, he gives two commands to the people. Verse 3, you could summarize it this way. He said, I want you to move your heart spiritually. I want you to move yourself spiritually. Your heart is not in the right place. I want your heart to get to the right place. And then in verse number 6, he says, I want you to move your body physically. Did you catch that when he says, I want you to go from where you are and I want you to gather together to Mitzpah. Now, the people of Israel were a pretty rebellious people. The people of Israel like to do their own thing. By the way, that's why a lot of us relate with the people of Israel. Because we have a lot of the similar characteristics within our own spiritual life, don't we? But here is a leader who says, I want you to move your heart spiritually, get right. I want you to move your body physically. This might not be something that you want to do. It might be inconvenient, but this is what I'm calling you to do. And the people of Israel, to their credit, said, okay, if you're the leader, if you're the one that God has called, then we are going to do that which you have called us to do. 
Now, before we get too far, let's consider this tonight. Nobody can have spiritual revival in their life when they live in a constant state of rebellion towards their God-given authorities. You cannot have true revival in your life when you're constantly at odds with those that God has placed over you. I mean, what have we been talking about in 1 Peter? This idea that we are to submit to those God-given authorities. Romans chapter number 13, that we are to submit ourselves, uh, not just to the government and not just to those things, uh, to those like the bosses and parents and those who we have in our lives, depending on what your age is uh, here tonight. And again, not submitting yourselves to unbiblical mandates, but submitting yourself to those who God has placed and understanding, unless they're speaking against the word of God, I just need to listen. I need to do what I'm told so I can present Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. But when we do not follow that which God has placed over us in leadership, listen, you can't have revival. Now, this might seem a little self-serving tonight. I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm the pastor of Liberty Baptist Church. I've always said when I have to announce that I'm the pastor here, that I'm out of control. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I'm the dad here. And the kid's like, yeah, we know. We just don't listen to you. I'm the pastor here. It's like, yeah, we know. We just don't care. Uh, What I'm saying tonight is this. There was a spiritual authority that got in front of them and said this. It's really not about me. It's about God. I am a spiritual leader here tonight. I'm just like you. I'm made from the same cloth as you are. I'm made from the same dust that you are tonight. But I do know this, God has laid a burden and a leadership role in my life. And although I have the same value in Christ as you do, there has been this role laid upon me. And one of the things that we have to have as revival is to be on the same page and going the same direction. But listen, it's not about this, follow me. It's as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. See, my job as a leader is not to say, look at me, I'm the man of God. By the way, that's gross. Uh, Just to pronounce yourself as the man of God and just pound the pulpit and say, I'm the one that you need to follow because I'm the pastor of the church. To be able to, as a servant leader, say, uh, I've been given this role, I admit that I have, but at the same time, we're all going to serve God together. We're all going to go together. And Samuel, by the way, was telling them to do something that he was willing to do himself. Samuel was telling them to do something that he was going to do within his own life as well. And Samuel wasn't pointing men to himself. He was pointing them to God. And you can't be revived in your spirit if you're not willing to be under, not my authority, but his authority. See, that's really what it comes down to. God says, this is what you need to do. Can we say it biblically? Thus saith the Lord. And when we say we want to go our own way and do our own thing, well, this is how I feel in 2024. Well, in my own situation, I feel like this is the way, what ends up being the statement or the word that sticks out in those types of statements is this, I feel. Our feelings really don't have anything to do with it. I'm not saying that feelings are all bad. I mean, certainly there's some wonderful feelings that God has given us. But at the same time, we don't navigate this word by how we feel about this word. In fact, there's some days I don't feel like doing this. There are some days I don't feel like participating in that which God has told me to do. But my feelings are irrelevant. I just need to place myself under His authority, submit myself under Him. Until I do so, I can't have revival. There are churches that are more places where uh, you could put up a ring and probably give people gloves, and that would be more fitting to what's going on in the church than it being a house of God. Those places won't have revival. Those places need revival. But until they say, I'm going to do whatever the Lord has for me in my life, then revival will not come. So the first thing we see is Israel, a very rebellious people, decide to do this. We'll listen. We'll listen. And by the way, listening and obeying isn't just for kids. It isn't just for the young ones. We never get too old to obey not just our God-given authorities, but most importantly, God himself. Because we say God-given authorities, which reminds us there's an authority higher than the authorities we have. It's all about him. So first of all, we see that necessary element of revival is they place themselves under leadership. But number two, and here's, boy, this is just, it's so simple, but it has to be said, they put away the things that were wrong. There were some things in their life that were sinful. There were things in their life that were hindering their walk with God. Look again in verse number three. It says this, If you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then, so if you want to return to the Lord, There's some things you must do. You can't just announce, I'm returning to the Lord. Okay, that's a great statement. But it must be followed by some action. 
If, then, if you do return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve Him only. Samuel gives two commands here in this verse. He says, I want you to put away and I want you to prepare. You know what put away means? Repent. Put it away. Change your mind about your sin. Change your position on your sin. 1 Peter 2, verse 11. We just talked about this long ago. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. I would submit to you tonight that the real enemy in this chapter isn't the approaching Philistines, but rather it's the fleshly lusts that have taken them down a disobedient path for more than 20 years. You know, sometimes we look around and we see the enemies that are within in the world and we see those who are opposing us and those who are against us. And certainly they are those that are against the things of God. But can I tell you, the real enemy within is the sinfulness of our own flesh and the sinful habits that we harbor within our own life. And God says this, if you want to return to me, if you want to have revival, you need to put away those things. You need to, to take them and you need to get them and move them out. They don't need to be part of your life anymore. That's why when you look at Nehemiah chapter number 8 and Nehemiah chapter number 9, by the way, if you have some time this week, read those two chapters. They're tremendous. Israel rebuilds the wall. They rededicate the wall, remember, after the captivity. And what do they do? They get up and they read the Word of God. It says a quarter of the day they read the Word of God. Could you imagine if we tried to do that here today? We just read the Word of God. They stood and they worshipped on their faces. They wept. They confessed their sins before God. And true revival took place for the people of God. But how can you be revived until you admit the reality of your spiritual state? Until you admit where you are and what you're dealing with. See, the, the young man, the prodigal, was not able to get out of the pig pen until he realized, I'm in a pig pen. Now, that doesn't seem like that's a very big thing. Well, how could he not know he's in the pig pen? No, no, he realized he was in a bigger mess than physical. He realized he was in a spiritual mess. And he recognized where he was, and he says, my father has hired servants that are treated better than I am. I need to go. I need to go to him. And what did he do? Could we say it this way? place himself back under his leadership. Is it any surprise that he removed himself from the leadership of his father and then went his own way and then everything went wrong when he wasted his substance with riotous living and then he realizes, you know, if I'm going to get out of this pig pen, there's some things I need to put away, then I will go and submit myself once again to my father. And that's when things started making sense again. So we see that he had to put away, but it also says this, he says, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord. I don't know about you, but that phrase is an interesting one. It's not one that we would often use. I was thinking about preaching, and I was thinking about maybe things that we say here in church, but we don't often say this, prepare your hearts for the Lord. I mean, we don't, but obviously it's biblical. It's right here. So we ask ourselves this, is this an element of revival? Is this an element of putting away the wrong, preparing our hearts for the things of God? And so I looked this up, and according to Strong's, this word prepare, this Hebrew word means to erect or to set up, you know, to, to, to build something, if you will. When I prepare for sermons, I have a very particular way in which I do so. I type in sermon.com, and I print out the... No, I'm just kidding. Um, some of you said, I knew it! I knew it! No, if only it was that easy. Um, I'm very particular about how I prepare for a sermon. I have my computer, which is the necessary element nowadays to be able to type out a sermon. I have my Bible always to my left. I typically have a cup of coffee if I'm right with the Lord that's right there helping me along the way to caffeinate me for the journey. And that's usually the first of several on my way to get the message. I have other books that I have. And then I prepare my message in the same way every time. I type in the same font, I use the same sizes, the same types of things are bolded, the same types of things are underlined. Things are, are done exactly the way every time. You say, well, why do you do that? Is it necessary? Maybe not, but I'm putting myself in the best position to be able to put together a sermon that I pray will be pleasing to God. Do you know what preparing your heart for the things of the Lord is? It's putting yourself in the best position 
It's erecting or setting up your heart in such a way. Just like I have books here and the Bible here and the coffee here and the computer here and all these things. I am placing things in order in my heart so that I can remove that which is bad and get things right for the Lord. Just like before you want to plant, as some of you are doing right now or you're planning on doing right now, and really the time is now, isn't it, to get some of those plantings done. Before you go, you gotta prepare that soil. It's amazing the rocks that bred in the soil just since last season. At least that's what it feels like, isn't it? It's like, I thought I took all the rocks out last season. It, w when do they get more of them? And the weeds that have to be taken out. What are you doing? There's some things that have to be taken out to have a heart that's right with the Lord. That's preparation. You've got to put away. You've got to prepare. This is necessary for revival. Preparing your heart means setting yourself up for spiritual success and putting yourself in the best possible position to serve the Lord. And are we as particular with preparing our heart for the Lord as we are with everything else in our life? Some of you are particular in the way that you have your tools set up. Some of you are particular in the way that you drive your car or that you maintain your car. Some of you are particular in the way that you study, uh, depending on what you're doing for maybe a college class or maybe some continuing education. Uh, some of you are very particular as far as some of your hobbies and things like that. Look, that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that at all. And I certainly don't want to say that that is an unusual thing or that's a poor thing. No, I, it, whatever we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we should give glory to God and we should give God our best in whatever we do. But if we do that for all these other menial things in the light of eternity, how much more when it comes to preparing our heart, the most precious commodity that God has given us, the very seat of our spiritual life, it's got to be prepared so that we can put away the things that we need to so we can have a right spirit before God. And you know what? Israel did it. Verse 4 says, Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. They did it by God's grace. So number one, we see they placed themselves under leadership. Number two, they put away the wrong. Number three, they pursued that which was right. They pursued that which was right. That might sound redundant, but it's not. It might sound like, well, didn't you just say that, Pastor? No. They had to stop serving other gods, which meant there was a vacuum. They had to stop doing those sinful activities, which meant there was a hole that needed to be filled. So what do they do? Well, to replace that which was bad, they had to put in that which is good. We won't serve Baal and Astaroth. We'll serve God. We will not participate in these sinful activities. We are going to participate in that which is good and wholesome and right in our spiritual life. And that's what revival is about. Sometimes we think revival is an independent Baptist preacher who's sweating and snotting and snorting and angry about everything and yelling and screaming and pointing and saying, repent, repent. And although that sounds kind of fun actually now that I think about it, but that's not what revival truly is. Just removing all of that bad stuff is not revival. I'm sorry, Everly. She, she, Everly can't take hard preaching. I guess that's what it is. That's all right. She'll get it. Dad will help her with that. That's all right. It's, a, it's not just about removing the bad, friend. It's about saying this. I've got to put in that which is right. I've got to put in that which is good. You know, if you need an oil change, you don't just take out the bad oil and then run the car. I did that once. <laughs> you don't just remove the bad oil. You put in that which is good, that which is right, so the car can continue to run and run well as it's supposed to. I want to do this quickly. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. All right, leave your space here, but Ephesians chapter 4. I want to go quickly here tonight. I want to be good with our time this evening, but I think this is important for us. Ephesians chapter number 4. There's a principle in the New Testament that we call put off and put on. Put off and put on. And although some of you might be abundantly familiar with this, I think for some of us we need the reminder, or some maybe it's the first time that you've heard something like this. If your clothes get dirty, you put them off. But praise God, you find some clean clothes and you put them on, don't you? If you have uh, oil that needs to be changed, you put it off. But then you put in some new oil. But that's the same for us in our spiritual life as well. Ephesians chapter number 4, look at verse number 22. Ephesians 4 verse number 22, which says this, That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And remember, conversation here is not just the way we talk, but it's the manner of life that we are to put off that old manner of life. Hey, the way you were before you got saved, put it off. The way you were before Jesus Christ, put it off. Take it off. You don't want that in your life. But 
be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That goes back to Romans chapter 12, doesn't it? Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That ye, what's those next two words? Put on. I'll give them to you. That ye put on the new man. Behold, we're not that old man anymore. All things have become new. We are new creatures in Christ. Put on the new man, which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness, wherefore putting away. Part of that putting on is the putting off and putting away that comes before. Put away, lying. Speak every truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And look at this. Neither give place to the devil. Neither give place to the devil. Do you know why this is so important? Because if you take things out of your spiritual life that are unhealthy, but then do not replace it with that which is good, you have now removed in this vacuum a place to give space for the devil to replace it with new bad stuff. Jesus talked about this, didn't it? Didn't he? What he said, uh, he says, you know, there, there is this time and there is this place where, uh, in fact, Luke 11, here it is, verse 24 to 26, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return unto my house when I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Basically saying this, if a demon was removed from a man, but the spirit of Christ did not come into that man, he could have seven devils come and replace it and be worse off than he was before. That It wasn't about just having those demons removed, but it was about Jesus Christ moving in through salvation. And for us, when we remove those things that are bad, listen, you need to cut out some of that nasty TV you're watching at home. Have some good entertainment that's wholesome that will help you in the evening. You know, there might be some music that is not good and not right that you listen to from the old days, from times when you were in the past uh, indulging in the flesh. Well, find some good godly music. There's never been a better time than now where we're able to access good godly music for free or at a very low cost, so much so that you don't even need a CD player. Most of us don't even know how to find a CD player. They're about as easy to find as an 8-track player at this point, aren't they? But we have access to these things. Listen, it's not just about an independent Baptist preacher saying, get all these nasty things out of your life. It's more than that. It's saying this, hey, let's put the good stuff in. Let's make sure we're feeding the soul with that which is right. That's what revival's all about. They placed themselves under leadership. They put away the wrong. They pursued that which was right, and they poured themselves out. Go back to our text very quickly, and I'll just say this quickly. When he went to Mitzpah, what did they do? They poured out water. That seems like a pretty strange thing, doesn't it? Everyone gather together. We're going to pour out some barrels of water. That seems like a very odd thing to call people to do. Uh, but yet we find that when they were called to empty themselves, and this was representative, representative rather of what God was calling them to do, to empty themselves of self. They poured themselves out. It's, uh, there's one uh, uh, commentator who said this, this signify that they thoroughly renounced idolatry, that nothing of it should remain, as when water is poured out of a cask, there remains no smell, as there does when other liquors are poured out. You know, we understand that, that if we have certain types of cups or certain types of vessels that they can become stained or they can start to smell like that which we have put inside of them. But what he is, they're saying here is everything that's inside of us that's bad, we're pouring it out to the last drop. It, we're representing that we're not leaving anything in that shouldn't be there. We're pouring it all out before the Lord. And then it says in verse number six, they also fasted as well, which meant this. They were fully and completely humbling themselves before the Lord. They said, we're pouring ourselves out. We are going to deny ourselves food or water. We don't know exactly what type of fast this was, but we do know this. They were literally laying themselves out bare before the Lord. And they're saying this, Lord, I completely and totally belong to you. And real revival is capstoned by this thought, Lord, everything about me belongs to you. And when we get to the point where we say everything, every portion of my life, every habit, every word, everything I hear, every activity I have, every single one of it belongs to you, that's the point where real revival can take place. Now here's what happens. God's people get revived. That's what happens here in this text. 
But do you remember the other half of the text, which we won't spend nearly as much time on tonight, and all God's people could say amen because I'm about to run out of time. But the other half of the text is this. The Philistines weren't happy about it. That shouldn't be a surprise to us. Because when you got right with the Lord, maybe when you got saved, or when you were maybe not living for the Lord, but then you got back to where the Lord wanted you to be, you had personal revival in your life, it probably wasn't the fact that the world was out there saying, we are so glad that you're going back to church three times a week. We are so glad that you are back in your Bible. We, we are so proud of you. We were hoping you would get back into the organized religion thing. I mean, this is a good thing. We are so, you no, know, they, they're the same ones, the Philistines, that will say, why are you wasting your time? Have you got into a cult? Or are you giving them money? Are, are you, how many times a week do you go? You know, we'll spend maybe four hours a week here if you come to three services and Sunday school, four hours a week, and most people will spend that watching one football game. And people will look at us and say, the Philistines will say, what, what's the matter with you? The Philistines come and attack. And here's the thing. Because Israel submits themselves to God, God blesses, God protects, and God brings the victory. You know, sometimes we sing that song, Here I raise my Ebenezer, Hither to thy help I've come. And sometimes maybe you've heard that and you thought, why are we singing about the Christmas carol? Because when we, the only time we talk about Ebenezer is the Scrooge kind. But before there was ever Bah Humbug and Ebenezer Scrooge, there was the stone Ebenezer that is found in 1 Samuel chapter number 7. And that stone was placed there as a reminder to people. We'll, we'll look at what it says in verse number 12. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. The word Ebenezer literally means God is our help. Here's what it comes down to. Many of us don't want to be revived in our Christian life because we don't think we can do it. And we don't think that if we start to walk down that road, that it will be sustainable. Or even third, that the world will just pound us down to such a point that we'll just give up. I'm going to look like I'm crazy. People are not going to understand what I'm doing. I've done this before and I've failed. I've fallen in the past. I just don't think I'm going to do it. True revival, where we submit ourselves to God, we remove that which is bad, we put that which is good back in, and then when we lay ourselves before God, we pour ourselves out and we say, everything about me belongs to you. That is at the place where God will become your help. That is the place where God will be your Ebenezer and he will come in. Now that doesn't mean that you're not gonna have problems. May I remind you, the Philistines were attacking. They were just minding their own business. In fact, Samuel, if you read very carefully, Samuel is making the sacrifice, and as he's making the sacrifice, in the middle of it, the Philistines say, you know what, now's a good time to charge. Well, you know what, if they weren't doing their religious service, if they were out there paying attention, no, no, what they were doing was paying attention to God, and God said this, I'll protect you. Because they're in the middle of the service, and they're not ready for battle. But God did what they could not do. And he thundered and he blew. And all of a sudden, those who were on attack were on the run. Now, they had to pick up their swords and they had to do some work as well. There's no doubt that there was an element there as well. But in the end, God was the one who protected them. And we could go back a few chapters and find when the people of Israel said, we have the Ark of the Covenant, we could never lose. And he said, oh yeah, watch this. And they lost the Ark of the Covenant. They lost two of the high priests, or two of the priests, and they lost the high priest all in one day. Ebenezer, God being your help, will truly come in your life when you fully and completely submit yourself to God in every area of your life. Now, there have been times
that God in his common grace, as we would often call it, will give us that which we don't deserve, even though we're rebellious to him. Because there have been times all of us have fallen short of what God's called us to be, and yet you still got a promotion at work. Someone still helped you financially. You got a good car at a great price. That's just God in his graciousness. But the general rule of our life is this. We reap what we sow. That God will help those who have submitted themselves completely and totally to him. No, no, I didn't say God helps those who help themselves. I'm saying that God will help. He will be the Ebenezer to those who have said, Lord, I'm asking you to help because I know I can't do it. So as we look at ourselves and we look at revival and we want to see what God is doing in this place, here's what we realize. You say, I've tried this in the past and I can't. I, I just want to live for the Lord, but I can't do it the way I want to. Or I, I, I failed or the people will make fun of me or my family won't understand. Listen, stop. Submit yourself and Ebenezer. God will help. You don't do that. You don't submit. God is under no requirement to be able to help you. But God has promised in his word that he will help those who have completely and totally submitted themselves to him. Revival isn't a spiritual frenzy. It's a serious focus on the things of God in a real and personal way. I'll give you this illustration. We'll be done tonight. Did I ever mention I coached girls basketball? It's been a while. It's been a while. The first day I coached a game of girls basketball, I went into the locker room. They, the girls would prepare themselves, and then they would send someone out to say that I could go in, and I would go in with my assistant coach and usually Diane as well, so that, uh, you know, propriety and such. And I remember going in, for the first game, and I'm ready. I mean, I'm just like Red Auerbach, you know, just everything but the cigar, I'm ready to go, you know what I'm saying? And I go in and those girls were laughing. They were laughing, Vince. <laughs> they had lotion, like from Bath and Body Works, they're lotioning their legs and their arms. They're talking about what they're gonna do after the game. They're talking about all of these things, and I went in there, and I don't wanna say I snapped, I didn't throw a folding chair like uh, Bobby Knight would have, but I did say, what are we doing? And they said, what do you mean? I said, what are we doing? I'm like, it ought to smell like sweat in here. They said, we haven't even played yet. I don't care. It ought not to smell like a bath and body works. What are you talking about? We got to talk about the game. We gotta have our mind on what we're doing in the next 20 minutes because it may be all fun and games in here now, but you're gonna get out there and you're gonna be embarrassed when the other team comes out and hoops it up and you're not even sure which direction you're going on the court. You know what happened? Exactly that. And we lost the first nine or 10 games in a row. I don't remember, the Lord has been gracious to erase a lot of that from my memory. A lot of it's just a haze to be honest with you. But you know what I found? That when they were willing to realize that this game was real to them, that there was a focus that was necessary, they got better. They began to win. Now here's the difference. You can be focused, you can be dialed in in sports and still not be very good. <laughs> I remember growing up, I loved basketball, playing basketball. But I played JV in the 10th grade and I didn't even start because I had all the coaching ability within me. I knew where the players were supposed to be. I knew what was supposed to happen, but I couldn't convince my body to do what my mind was telling it to do. And so because of that, we played 20 games. And I scored 16 points over 20 games. We went to the playoffs. We won the championship. They didn't even, they didn't even let me touch the floor during the playoffs. Like the games count now. You can't even be out there. But I was focused, but they wouldn't let me play. Because some have more talent and some have less. You know the wonderful thing about the spiritual life? Is sometimes I think we think that people are the same way. There are some people, we well, you know what, they're just more spiritual. Oh, they just have a closer walk with the Lord. You know, they just have that edge that I, I wish that I could have. I wish it. Do you realize the ground is even at the cross? That every single one of us 
have the same ability. Now, we're, we're in different places in our spiritual journey, certainly. Some have gone farther than others. Some have gone uh, in more obedience for longer than others have. But do you realize if we can focus not on all those other things, but focus not on the game, but the reality of the spiritual life, that as we focus on Him, that He will be our help and the victories start to pile up, not because of us, but because of Him. I want Liberty Baptist Church to be a place where people come in and see God is alive and God is real. Meaning this, I want them to realize when they come in here that God is alive and that they need to be saved. But also, that that's not just true from the Word of God, but He's real because we all believe it because we act like we believe it. That we love one another. That when we have quarrels with one another, we make them right. That we realize that every single one of us have a beam in our eye and we shouldn't be caring so much about the moat in the other eye. Or that when there is aught that needs to be taken care of, it's done so biblically and lovingly and carefully as sometimes does need to be done. That we come here and we do that which is right, but we go home and we strive our best to do that which is right in just the same way. That we don't come here and talk about the Lord and how much we love Him and take in entertainment all week that curses His name. That we have an understanding that He is alive and He is real. That's what revival is about. But for that to happen, we have to put ourselves under His authority. We remove that which is wrong. We put in that which is right. And we pour ourselves out completely and totally Him. And that spiritual focus of revival will allow us to have victory in our Christian life. Thank you for listening to this sermon from the pulpit of Liberty Baptist Church. If this message was a blessing to you, or if there's any way we can serve you, please let us know by contacting us at info at mylibertybaptist.org, or you can visit us this Sunday at 800 Washington Street in Easton, Massachusetts. May the Lord bless you as you grow in His Word.